Hello, Reactathon. I'm really excited to be joining you today. I hope all of you are safe and at home. And today we're going to talk a little bit about TypeSafe Full Stack React. It's a broad introduction for those people who haven't considered it, and a live demo for people who have. And hopefully you might learn a new thing or two. So let's get started. So for those of you who don't know me, hi, I'm Sean. I am sitting here in Singapore, but I could be anywhere as far as you're concerned. And I also go by Swix on the internet. That's my English and Chinese initials. I've had the privilege of giving some well-received React talks in the past. In 2018, I kicked off my React conference speaking career with Why React is Not Reactive at React Rally 2018. And then in 2019, I followed it up by giving my talk on hooks and cloning a React clone from scratch in 29 lines of code live on stage. And that was pretty much the scariest and best received talk that I've done. In 2020, I also extended that to concurrent React. So giving an explanation in live code demo of React Fiber, as well as the implications of that with time slicing and React Suspense. But more recently, my interests have turned from React internals towards everything around React, the tooling and the developer communities around React. And that's what we're here to talk about today, the stunning evolution and adoption of TypeScript within the React ecosystem. And why is type safety so important to React? Well, I can pretty much make that argument in two words, and that's shifting left. Shifting left is this concept that's kind of new to web development or obscure in web development, but it's not new to software engineering in general. So if you look at IBM, who did a survey of their hundreds of thousands of consultants and consulting projects, they discovered that there's a correlation between how late in the process of the software development cycle where they catch a bug versus how much it takes to actually fix that. And it's also non-linear. So if you arrange the software process from design to implementation to testing to maintaining a production application from left to right, the further right it shifts towards something that's already shipped, then the more expensive it is to fix that bug. So a bug in production is like a hundred times more expensive than if it was caught at the design stage. I like this quote that people have that you can save weeks and weeks of coding with just hours of planning. And I think that that's a really true statement. Even more than that, you can automate a lot of that planning and checking with type systems. So the way I pitch this is it's not just type systems, it's also about building automated developer tools. So let's translate this shift left concept into terminology that we understand because we're not IBM. So instead of relying on user bug reports and manual QA, we can actually run tests inside of CI, CD setup environments. But instead of running that entire test suite, we can actually just run tests on incremental commit hooks and diffs. So it's even faster. So what else can we do that increases the feedback loop even faster than that? We can shift left again, and we can run formatting on save. That's what Prettier is about. And that actually unlocks another order of magnitude improvement in our software development cycle. But what can we do that shifts even further left than that? Well, while we read our code, our IDEs can actually tell us if we've written code that's wrong. So that's what the TypeScript language server and syntax highlighting in IDEs do for us. They tell us when code looks wrong while we're writing that code. We don't even have to save. We don't have to commit. We don't have to build or run it. We can just look at it while we write. And that is the highest possible version of shifting left in terms of our error detection. Everything that we're doing here is to try to reduce the length of time it takes to discover code errors and it should directly translate to dollars spent as well. The shift left idea also trickles down in terms of other features that are also nice. Fearless refactoring is this concept I really like, which says that the only way to avoid tech debt is to not be afraid of refactoring your code base at any point. And the only way to not be afraid of refactoring your code bases at any point is if your developer tools help you refactor. So I can refactor any part of my code base, and if anything was forgotten or if I broke any code, I don't have to run the code again. The IDE would mostly just tell me what I need to fix. TypeScript and type safety also helps you generate autocomplete because that's another implication of type checking. It's kind of the inverse. TypeScript also helps you inline documentation so you don't have to remember what exactly each name means. You can just hover over variables and functions and it tells you what it does in terms of type signatures or type annotations. 
But I do want you to know that types do not replace tests. I actually wrote a post on CSS Tricks on why types and tests serve overlapping but different purposes, and I encourage you to check that out. I'm personally quite tired of this discussion because I think it's a solved issue that you should have both. My ultimate sales pitch to you on why type safety is that you can go from moving fast and breaking things to move fast without breaking things. And that's ultimately what we all want, right? Okay, so let's talk about type safe front ends. I've helped to maintain the React and TypeScript cheat sheets for over two years, and I've learned a lot about this. So normally I just give a screenshot of what this basic component looks like, but because this is pre-recorded video, I can go one step better and actually show you inside of a TypeScript playground. So here I have a basic function component, and it's being used inside of an app. This looks exactly like JavaScript because it is, and that actually shows you one of the benefits of TypeScript, which is that it is a superset of JavaScript. Any valid JavaScript is valid TypeScript under the right settings. Obviously, you can make it a little bit more strict, and that's a little bit of what we're going to do. So here, we're going to turn on the no implicit any check, and that's going to start causing errors. So it's going to start telling us that props implicitly has an any type. So we need to give the type and specify the type of the component. So let's go ahead and say that my type of component um, is going to have an ID, and the ID is going to be a string. So let's put that in there. And this is going to type check properly. properly. So when I hover over props.id, it's going to tell me that is a string. OK, so that's a simple React and TypeScript app. But what if we wanted to do a refactor? That's exactly what we're trying to go for, right? So let's say I wanted to change my ID into a number. So if I change that number here, it's going to light up accordingly. So for example, here I wanted to say I wanted to run a specific number function like two exponential. I don't know what this is. So it's going to document what I need to put in there. So it must be in a range 0 to 20. Uh, excellent. OK, I can just say 15. I don't really care what it is. But now I can just see that this code type checks because this, the, this returns the appropriate value. But also I can see that here um, I have another place in my app that I need to fix as well. So I need to change this instead of supplying a string into a number. So that's a very simple demonstration of what the refactoring workflow looks like and what designing with types helps you consider when you're doing re development with React and TypeScript. TypeScript types are basically instructions to the TypeScript language server and compiler that says, you know, ID is of a certain type. So let's try something a little bit more complicated. With our stateful component, we're annotating both props and state. And I'm doing it both in terms of the class component style as well as the function component styles using hooks. You can see how hooks are a lot more concise to type with TypeScript. That was not a motivation, but it was definitely a nice to have and a plus in favor of adopting hooks. The classes versus hooks discussion is also something I'm not very interested in discussing, so leave your flame wars in the comments. But in general, what applies for props also applies for state. If you try to refactor anything in a state, then the rest of your app is going to update accordingly and that's a very useful thing to have in your React app. So that's a super brief introduction. There's a lot more. For example, when you're making custom hooks, here I have a custom use loading hook, which covers a use state hook, but then also has some custom behavior going on. This hook just helps to wrap any promise so that it tracks the loading state and then unsets the loading state once the promise completes. And it returns that loading state as a Boolean and it gives you a function which you can call to use generically. The trick here is that you cannot just return is loading and load in an array like you would in regular JavaScript because TypeScript would infer this weird type that is very hard to use, a union type of both Boolean and load. Instead, you actually need to specify this special as const syntax of TypeScript, and that actually tells TypeScript to infer it as a tuple. So in each place instead of assuming that I'll have a general type that matches each of the locations in the array. And here is where we use it in an app as a sample where I can wrap any promise and get out that loading state which I can use to show a loading indicator. There's a bunch of these little tricks that you need in TypeScript in order to do these things. So it's not exactly clean. There is a learning curve, but hopefully it's worth it. And you know what? Most of the ecosystem has decided that it's worth it. So here I have a tracker 
of the React ecosystem libraries that are either written in TypeScript or have rewritten their core in TypeScript. So they don't just offer TypeScript types or indefinitely typed or like a separate typed file. Their internals are written in TypeScript. And so that's Next.js, React Native, React Router, Expo, Redux, Yarn, Jest, and so on. Gatsby, I think, now fully supports TypeScript as of uh, November 2020. The other thing that's very gratifying is that it starts to bleed over from open source into closed source, large scale production systems. One of the most compelling stories comes from Brebunge at Airbnb, where she drove the adoption of TypeScript at Airbnb. And according to their own study, because they keep very rigorous postmortems, 38% of Airbnb bugs were preventable with TypeScript. It's also a very compelling story for those who think that you don't need TypeScript if you test enough because, of course, Airbnb also tests very, very rigorously. If you were around Tech Twitter last year when this became a story and it was announced, then you probably saw this version of this photo and it spread pretty virally around JavaScript Twitter. The reason was this talk wasn't publicly streamed and I just happened to be in a room, so I'm happy to have my little contribution to React and TypeScript lore. If you want to get started learning, then definitely check out my repo. It's completely free. It's called React and TypeScript Cheat Sheet. There's a GitHub version where you can just read in pure markdown, but there's also a hosted version with search. I definitely like using the search feature for anything I need to look up. We definitely need contributors, so please dig through the issues and ask questions or answer them as they come up. Okay, so that's the front end. I think that's more of a solved problem. The harder problem is actually type safe backends which is something that we're not so clear about. I think probably the winner in this space, especially for the JS ecosystem, is GraphQL. GraphQL itself has a schema definition language instead of a type language, but it's pretty much the same thing. This is part of the spec of GraphQL, and you can see how they're used on the graphql.org site. You can declare enums, you can declare types. Types can have IDs or strings or numbers, uh, or they can also embed other types. And as for queries, you can also have a type of query, or you can have a type of mutation, and that is all wrapped up in your overall schema. That's essentially the raw spec, and there's extensions that we can do to that spec. But based on these type declarations, we can start to generate tooling. Everyone who's used GraphQL probably knows this, but there's a tool called Graphical. If you haven't come across it, definitely check it out, because this is probably one of the most effective, inspirational, influential tools that I've ever come across. It's like a REPL for your query, so it actually runs against a real GraphQL endpoint. You can do queries, see those sample responses. You can also check out inline documentation. Even if it's deprecated, we can note that it's deprecated and we can tell people what else they should be using. Every single GraphQL request is validated before it runs, so if you get a badly formed request, it won't even go through. There's a very standard error resolution process that happens when a bad request comes in. So this is very similar to how TypeScript works for the front end, but applies to the back end. Additionally, if you use GraphQL right, you can also get savings in data transfer that makes your apps work faster and your bandwidth go down. There is a lot of pros and cons to this design, and it's hotly debated, so I'm not going to cover it all. But I just want to make sure that the point is made that because you have type safe backends, then very good tooling can be generated based on your type safe backends. And because it's an industry standard, we share the cost of developing things like Graphical, and that makes GraphQL a lot easier to work with. So from backend to frontend, we then need to hook it up, and that's the tricky part. One of the cool projects that I like to see in this space is called GraphQL Code Generator. It says what it does. It takes GraphQL and it generates code. In our case, it generates TypeScript code. And that's exactly what we need to take types from backend to frontend. This isn't the only strategy in this space. You can also go from TypeScript to GraphQL. And that's what these two popular projects do, Type GraphQL and GraphQL Nexus. They both have different ways. One uses decorators, the other uses standard TypeScript functions. But both are ways of describing what your types are in a way that can also be parsed to generate GraphQL. There's also smaller solutions like Type GQL and DEC API that are exploring different solutions in this problem space. However, I just want to step back a little bit and address the elephant in the room, which is that we want to enable all of this in order to get better user experience by creating more reliable apps without tech debt. But in order to get there, we need to stitch together all of these tools and our developer experience 
goes down, especially at the initial part when there's a learning curve and we have to figure out how to make all of these tools talk together because they weren't designed with a single coherent mindset. There's a lot of complexity in order to get all your ducks in a row to get a full stack type safe experience. You need to pick your backend resources and then you need to write GraphQL resolvers for them. You need to generate TypeScript types and then you also need to have client GraphQL or TypeScript libraries. And then for everything else that you might need, like offline syncing or real-time web sockets, you have to write custom, custom code. And probably your, the open source ecosystem is not well developed enough for you to do all of this out of the box. So the end result of reaching this type safe full stack React goal is that we either glue together our own framework and have to maintain a lot of glue code, or we use an integrated framework designed for this workflow. And that's something I'm interested in exploring at AWS and working on. So for each of these solutions, we have AWS AppSync that provides our backend resources like database, but it also acts as a GraphQL gateway. GraphQL Transform, which is an open source library that helps to write these GraphQL resolvers and TypeScript types. And AWS Amplify helps to do the code generation, but then also provides the client libraries that you can use to access the resources that you've provided. So let me show you what this looks like and the ultimate vision of how we can reduce all the boilerplate, but actually still achieve this user experience of full stack type safe React. So at AWS, we've actually extended GraphQL. GraphQL is made to be extensible. And one of those ways in which it does that is this cool idea called directives. Directives are anything with an at on top of them. So for example, if you write a type in standard schema definition language and you have this, all these fields with standard GraphQL SDL, we can actually just add an at model, and that's some, that only means whatever we make it to mean. GraphQL has no opinion on that. So we can just throw it onto here, and if we have an integrated toolkit, we can actually spin up the resources that are required to make this into a CRUD-enabled model. So we can say, all right, we have a type post inside of our GraphQL. Let's spin up the functionality to create posts, read posts, update, and delete posts, and do that on the back end as well as the front end. And that's a fair amount of value add. Typically, the hard part of implementing GraphQL backends is that you have to write a lot of boilerplate for spinning up all these things. These are all generated for you just by writing at model, just six characters, and it saves you a lot of code. Now, I want to stress that this isn't the only solution that does this. So Hasura and FaunaDB both offer similar approaches where you can just specify the GraphQL schema and it spins up the required database resources. They just have different underlying databases backing them. So for sure, this is not at all a unique insight, but this is AppSync and this is the AWS solution if you want to use AWS infrastructure. So, all right, we have at model. What other directives can we try? We can also try adding off, right? Because, you know, you want to have some authentication when you do CRUD. The only trick is you do need some off service. So of course, if you have an integrated tool chain, then you can add in something like Amazon Cognito, which is AWS's standard off service in front of AppSync. The main trick that you have to figure out when you're implementing such a solution is you have to figure out how to let users specify rules for who can access what. So for example, you need ways to specify if the whole model is private or if anyone can read, but only the owner of the model can write. And you need to be able to do this at the model level as well as the field level. How about search? Imagine adding search capability with one more directive and then auto-generating search post functionality with the exact same workflow as everything else that you use. So these are all really interesting and there are other directives that you can check out with the GraphQL transform library. We're not gonna cover everything exactly, but I just wanted to introduce you to this concept because you've done the SDL definition work whenever you use GraphQL. But you might as well use that to spin up a backend and then you can flow the types to the front end with an auto-generated toolchain. So for the amount of work that you do just to do that, it's actually very powerful to express your full stack type safe React. That actually brings us to the demo that I've set up and I have just enough time to do it. So let's get started. I have here a simple create React app. It's been set up with TypeScript and Chakra UI for some nice styling. It's pretty much an extension of what I already showed you with React and TypeScript. Here it's running and I already have all the client side logic in place and I can submit and it's gonna load uh, some values. The only issue is that there's no persistence. So if I refresh this app, it's not gonna remember anything. So our task is to wire it up so it becomes full stack and type safe. The first thing I'm gonna do is I'm gonna initialize my backend. So I'm going to run amplify init 
And that actually asks me a few questions to get these process started. I'm just going to enter the defaults for all of them, but obviously you can customize it however you like. And it's going to auto detect my create React app settings. So I don't have to modify any of these, but I could if I wanted to. All right, the next process is to add our backend GraphQL API. So I'm going to run Amplify Add API, which is the standard workflow, Amplify Add, whatever category I'm trying to add. I'm going to pick GraphQL. And again, I'm going to use choose the defaults for whatever they offer me. By default, they're going to offer me a to-do model. I should probably replace that with something that I'm expecting. So it's just going to slightly extend that into a simple blog post model. And now I can run Amplify Push to provision those resources that I just established. As part of the push process, we also get to configure the code generation for our front end types. So we get a full stack all the way from GraphQL all the way to our front end types. So let's say yes to generate code. And we're going to pick TypeScript because. And we can just hit enter to select all the defaults for the rest. So the push and code generation does a couple things. And I'm going to talk you through them. The first thing that you should check out is inside of your source folder, you have an AWS exports.js file. And this contains all of the configuration information that is automatically set up for you by the CLI. So all you really need to do is import it. Just importing it at the root of your app sets up your app to connect with the AWS backend resources. The other thing that's changed is that we have a new GraphQL folder where all the TypeScript types have been generated by default based on our models. So for queries, we have get blog and list blogs and then mutation, we have create and update and delete. So everything as you might expect. So inside of our app, we can actually import whatever queries have been auto-generated by our CLI, and then we can use them inside of our React and TypeScript code. As you can see here, I make use of api.graphql, and I need to import that from the client library, which I also need to install. So yarn add AWS Amplify. That gives us the api.graphql function, as well as its typings. And we can also use this to do our create operation. So we can import create blog and set the variables to the new values that we've set in our React app. We should also make sure to import the create blog function from mutations. All right, let's have a look at what happens when we run this app now. I'm going to let it take up the full screen and Let's just autofill some content, autofill some more. And now when I refresh, all the data should continue to be there. Something else that I really appreciate about this workflow is that it decomposes nicely to the underlying AWS services for more control if I need them. So I can type Amplify Console here, and it's going to open up the raw services for example, here we added the GraphQL API, so I can actually view this in AppSync and perform the exact same GraphQL queries that I was doing in my code uh, inside of this little UI that we have over here. So I can say list blogs, and I can just say, give me all of them, uh, body, title, image, let's go. And this is exactly the query that I was performing. And you can actually play with this. But also, you can see inside of our data sources, I can see that it's been provisioned by DynamoDB. I can use other data sources like uh, Aurora. And inside of DynamoDB, I have access to all the other capabilities that regular DynamoDB has, as well as the cost and scaling benefits. So here I can access all the raw data and access without Amplify, and I have full ability to eject from whatever setup has been created. So that's a really nice fallback option if I need it. Now I realized that was a really quick demo and there's no time to cover all the really cool stuff like real-time subscriptions or offline caching, but you can check that out on your own. Mostly, I just want to introduce you to the overall concept of an integrated toolkit, right? Amplify provides the CLI that you saw, the client libraries that you saw, and the things that we didn't see are UI components for you to get set up quickly. So for example, authentication, you might want to have an authentication component in your favorite framework. So using this unified workflow, we can access all the other categories that are exposed to us via uh, AWS, like analytics, AI ML predictions, uh, authentication, data, storage for, with uh, Amazon S3, and uh, Amplify Data Store. All of these are really, really cool features, and they just take 10 hours to <laughs> go through all of them. But I encourage you to check it out if you're interested in this idea of a full-stack integrated serverless approach. That is TypeSafe. 
Amplify only started about two years ago, and it's getting a lot of traction. It's one of the fastest growing services within AWS, and new categories are getting added all the time. Uh, so, in fact, this year we actually added live streaming video just in time for the madness of 2020. Uh, it's almost like we planned it, but we did not. Anyway, I want to bring it back to TypeSafe full stack React, and I want to acknowledge another Reactathon speaker, Lauren Tan, who actually gave me this idea that and she first wrote about the strongly typed graph. And she says that the strongly typed graph builds upon end-to-end -end type coverage and connects diverse domains into a single graph. And that's a little bit of what we saw today, just to give you a sample. It gives teams near real-time visibility of how changes in the larger graph affect your entire organization. And that's the ultimate vision of how we can shift left our error discovery and resolution and improve our developer velocity and increase user experience without the cost of developer experience. So thank you. That was a really quick whirlwind tour throughout all of React and TypeScript and GraphQL and AWS. And I hope you stuck through it with me. I'll be around to answer any questions. See ya and have a great day tomorrow.